In this chapter 53, we'll talk about alterations in the integumentary system. And, uh, you know, we've learned back in AMP that the integument or skin is, first of all, your largest organ. Uh, it has several different functions as well. Uh, for one, it's involved with protection. You know, it protects against chemical factors, biological factors, and it also protects against water loss. You know, one of the major functions of the skin is to prevent our bodies from dehydrating. So uh, although your skin can perspire, it also serves as a nice protective barrier against water absorption and water loss. And we also know that your skin's involved with temperature regulation in the sense that it actually has sweat glands, which are active if your body temperature is too warm. That way you can perspire uh, sweat and then that you get an evaporative cooling effect. Uh, it's also involved with uh, cooling off in the sense that you can increase blood flow to skin if your internal body temperature is too warm. Now, it plays a role in metabolic regulation because skins can synthesize the hormone vitamin D. Uh, it's also involved with immune defense because you find a lot of dendritic cells and other leukocytes within skin. It has a variety of different types of sensory receptors that are involved with sensing, well, somatosensory functions, so things like touch, temperature, vibration, pressure and pain, uh, it also excretes wastes through the secretions of skin. So if some of your skin secretions include things like sweat and oil, some of your body's wastes are excreted through these types of secretions. Now remember, integument is skin, it's your largest organ. We got two major layers here, epidermis and dermis. Remember the epidermis is the superficial layer of skin made of stratified squamous epithelium. Dermis is the deeper layer of skin made of areolar in the papillary layer of, of dermis and dense irregular connective tissue in the reticular layer of dermis. Now the subcutaneous layer is technically not part of skin. We call this hypodermis, primarily made of loose areolar and adipose. And uh, it's not part of skin, but we talk about it as being nearby because, well, it helps anchor skin to underlying tissues like muscle and bone. So this is just showing just a classic cube of skin, obviously zoomed in quite a bit. And you can see here, this layer, outermost layer here, more superficial, is the epidermis. And then deep to that, we have the dermis. And then if it has a lot of adipose in it, this is the hypodermis or subcutaneous tissue. Now, the actual skin itself is only several millimeters thick. So what we're looking at here is zoomed in quite a bit. And stratified squamous epithelium here is avascular because it's an epithelium. It's all highly cellular, but it also has a lot of protective functions because these types of cells here, keratinocytes, are full of the protein keratin, which plays a role in waterproofing. Now, the stratum basale down here contains, you know, stem cells like, um, you know, dividing keratinocytes, and it also has melanocytes that produce a pigmented molecule, melanin, which is, gets incorporated into the growing keratinocytes. That way your skin gets a pigment that helps to protect against UV radiation. Now, deep to the epidermis, what we have then is the dermis. It's got two major layers. We have the papillary layer of dermis and the reticular layer of dermis. Remember, the papillary layer is this peg-shaped or nipple-shaped layer here, and it's full of loose areolar connective tissue. And if you all remember, going back to tissues, loose areola had a lot of ground substance, very little fibers, but that ground substance was nourishing. And uh, what's nice then is we also have capillary loops within this papillary layer that can allow for nutrients to diffuse out of your bloodstream, dissolve within the ground substance of this tissue, and then basically nourish the epidermis from the underside. Now, uh, we also find Meisner's corpuscles, which are involved with uh, tactile sense and some vibration sense. Deep to that, we have the reticular layer of dermis, which uh, you know is made of dense, irregular connective tissue, so it's a little bit more tough, but it contains a majority of the accessory structures of your skin, you know, things like hair, the hair follicle, other sensory endings like the tactile receptors, uh, also free nerve endings and a root hair plexus, which can help de uh, detect changes in the position of your hair. Uh, we also have sweat glands, which are basically sudoriferous glands. This Specifically, this one's a American sweat gland, which secretes a watery type of solution on the surface of your skin to help cool down. Now we see that our hair follicles have sebaceous glands associated with them, and these are essentially our oil glands that help to uh, condition your skin and help serve as a nice waterproofing barrier as well. And um, your hair itself is made of keratin, which are basically just is a very strong protein. And the functions of hair involve protection and sensory reception. 
Now you can see here though, deeper in the skin, we have a dividing line here between the dermis and, and subcutaneous tissue, where you find a lot of, lot of larger blood vessels. In fact, your skin contains up to 20% of your body's blood because it's so rich in blood vessels. So we think of the skin as being kind of like a reservoir of blood. And so in that sense, it actually helps you cool down by diverting even more blood flow to skin. You can help dissipate, dissipate heat away from your body. Now, deep within the subcutaneous tissue here, we actually have, um, you know, adipose and, you know, lots of more blood, blood vessels and fascia, you know, basically tissues that help to store nutrients like adipose. In fascia, which actually helps to anchor dermis to underlying muscles and bone so that skin's actually attached to the rest of your body. It's not just loose. Now, the epidermis actually undergoes some age-related changes. So we see that there are some degenerative changes associated with aging. You know, things like exposure to sunlight over the course of your lifetime are an important factor in the development of aged skin. Uh, and so you'll find that individuals who have more UV exposure typically have more advancedly aged skin than others. Uh, we also see that in elderly, the epidermis becomes thinner. So instead of being a thick protective layer or thicker protective layer, it's thinner and less protective. It's weaker so that the elderly are more prone to, you know, basically tears within their skin. Now, we also find that the cells of your epidermis are less orderly arranged and therefore uh, a little bit more weak and the cells reproduce more slowly. So it's, it takes longer for this, these cells to regenerate which also explains why the epidermis is thinner. Now the dermis is less elastic in elderly because of less elastin, and there's also an increase in the collagen to elastin ratio, so that <clears throat> due to a decrease in elastin, it, de it loses its elasticity and it becomes a little bit more uh, rigid. Now uh, collagen fibers become cross-linked and rearranged into thicker bundles, which we call elastosis, which gives skin less of a smooth in appearance and a little bit more wrinkled. Uh, in terms of hair changes, because uh, you know hair is associated with skin, we find that after age 40, there's progressive hair loss in both sexes. In males, we find that there's actually a male pattern baldness. We call this true baldness or frank baldness. It's associated with testosterone levels. So dihydrotestosterone, DHT, is this variety of testosterone that's associated with male pattern baldness. And just generally, there's hair thinning for both sexes uh, as we get older. Now, nails also become more dull, brittle, hard, and thicker with aging. Uh, changes are due to diminished blood supply to the nail bed, as well as the nail matrix, so that nails don't grow as rapidly. They also grow more weakly. And there's an increase in longitudinal striations that can put you at risk for splitting of the nail surface. So it's important to note that elderly's nails are a little more brittle. So if you give them a task that requires the use of their nails, it's more likely that they might actually chip their nail. Now, uh, our glands of our skin also become less active, uh, in part due to atrophy. So what we find is that there's a decrease in the secretion of sebum, which means elderly individual skin will typically be drier, um, and this actually leads to coarser skin. Sweat glands also generally decrease in size, number, and function, so that the elderly have difficulty regulating body temperature if they're too warm. Now, other changes in the integumentary system, uh, just generally protective function declines as we get older. Skin becomes readily uh, injured more easily rather. It also heals more slowly. You know, something that might just be a scratch on a younger individual could actually be a pretty deep wound in an elderly. Now sensory nerves and blood vessels also decline and because of this lack of sensation, uh, they are able to control blood flow as well and they aren't able to feel their skin as well. So they're more prone to injury associated with you know, uh, re repetitive activities or pressure. Uh, the dermis is also less vascular. Now this, this actually results in what we call senile purpura, which are just you know, sort of uh, collections of blood within the dermis. We also get at cherry angiomas, venous stasis, and venous lakes, which through the skin uh, have sort of uh, pigmented regions uh, that look like hematomas or blood clots. Uh, what, this is, what this slide is showing is actually an example of a truck driver, and you're seeing uh, basically on his face the effects of UV radiation exposure over the course of a lifetime. Now, uh, what we see then is right down the midline, if you look to the right side of his face, this is the passenger side, uh, and so you got to imagine then that because this is farther from the window, driver side window, that this would actually have received less, less sunlight exposure because he was a truck driver. But if you look at the left side of the face, you see that this is near the driver window side. 
And because this would have had more sun exposure, you can see the effect of sun exposure on the left side of his face. Um, it's even more than just wrinkles here. You can see that, that the underlying dermis is so uh, degraded from that UV exposure and cross-linked that it's actually causing the skin of his face to sag and droop lower than the right, which actually makes his eye look like it's drooping with respect to the right as well. And that's, that's it kind of explains the difference here. Now, you'll notice that there's some what look lesions here. You know, this could be some squamous cell. It's difficult to say without biopsy. But, you know, one thing that's important to note is that uh, UV exposure also puts you at risk for skin cancer, which we'll talk about later. Now, in terms of evaluating uh, lesions on the skin, we want to evaluate them based on their size, color, symmetry, shape, number, distribution, and whether it's a primary or a secondary lesion. So in order to get this kind of information, first of all, you have to do a visual examination, even palpate the skin as well, and also get a sense of, of the patient's history. You know, assessing family personal history is important because if it's a new mole, that's more important to check out than if it's a mole that they've had their entire lifetime. Um, however, moles that you've had your entire lifetime can still become cancerous. Now, uh, geographic origin plays a role as well because there's different types of parasites and different sorts of skin conditions that are associated with geography, as well as season, because certain skin conditions have a seasonal pattern of, of occurrence. Occupation plays a role, as well as a leisure activity, and really any other diseases or previous treatments that uh, may affect the skin. Now, to differentiate between primary and secondary lesions, the primary lesion is the original appearance of that on the skin. So this is where it first starts to become visible in the skin, looks different than the surrounding skin, that's the original appearance. A secondary lesion is the appearance of that skin after it's been modified by, you know, over time and by external agents like scratching. You know, if it's an itchy type patch of skin due to rash or possibly even cancer or infection, you know, uh, the fact that someone's itching it will make it look different and you got to take this into account with, with diagnosis. Now, uh, we can divide our skin disorders into two major categories. We've got the inflammatory and infectious disorders, as well as the proliferative and neoplastic disorders. Now, those inflammatory and infectious disorders, like it sounds like, they are due to inflammation, which could be due to, due to hypersensitivities or infectious agents, which can range all the way from viruses to parasites and insects. Now, proliferative and neoplastic diseases refer to uh, conditions that cause overgrowth of our skin cells, and those may or may not be uh, benign. And skin cancer is one of the most common malignancies in the U.S. A lot of people also have benign skin growths, but it's important to differentiate between the two. So we'll get into these disorders as well. Now, in order, in order to classify these lesions, we gotta describe, describe their size, shape, and other characteristics. So what this table shows is essentially just the terms we use to describe different varieties of uh, skin eruptions. So a bulla is essentially a large fluid-filled lesion. And a bulla is larger than a vesicle. So vesicles, you can see down here, are smaller. And there's still a fluid-filled fl lesion, but vesicles are much smaller. So we can also call these bullae as well. So bulla are like a large fluid-filled lesion uh, within the skin. Now, uh, we can differentiate that from a plaque because our plaques are more of a, of a raised patch of skin that can also be kind of harder. And we can differentiate this also from a pustule because these contain pus, right? So pus is a different type of fluid that's going to be really rich in you know, digested material as well as immune cells. So we can differentiate whether it's a pustule or a bulla based on the type of fluid you find within that sort of lesion. Now, uh, papules are also a raised lesion, but if you look here, you see that it's not fluid-filled. It's just sort of a, a, a bump within the skin because of a thickening or inflammation within that local area of tissue. Papules are also kind of small, not necessarily large. And we can differentiate this from a nodule because nodules are solid ra raised lesions that are larger than a papule. And uh, that's essentially just the term we use to describe a, a large papule would be a nodule. And again, you find this on the surface of skin. Now, macules are a raised, flat lesion that can have a kind of a colored region, too. And these macules are kind of plateau-shaped, if you think about it. Like, they're raised, but they're flat. Okay. 
Now, uh, a wheel down here is a smooth, rounded, slightly raised area that can be associated with itching, and you find these more commonly associated with urticaria or itching in hives, uh, so probably due to allergy. And so that can differentiate then between, let's say, a bula and a wheel, is that wheels are more likely to be, uh, you know, puritic or itchy, whereas a bula may not necessarily be itchy. Now, uh, ulcers are essentially just erosions into the surface of skin. And, uh, you know, this is essentially just from destruction of the skin layer, possibly even in the subcutaneous tissue, depending on how deep that ulcer is. We can classify ulcers based on their depth. Now, uh, last but not least, you guys, we have a fissure here. And a fissure is essentially a crack or a break in the skin. So what you'll find is that as we go through this chapter, these types of terms will pop up. We'll talk about macules and nodules, plaques and ulcers, wheels and pustules, vesicles and fissures. And uh, these basically describe you know, these characteristics. So we're going to first talk about those infectious inflammatory disorders first. And the first subset of infectious inflammatory disorders of the skin, we'll talk about the viral infections of skin. So the first set of viruses we'll talk about are Vrusiae, which are essentially warts. Now these are caused by human papillomaviruses, and there's a wide variety of different types of papillomaviruses that can cause warts or Vrusiae. They're essentially a DNA virus, and uh, they can resolve spontaneously as long as your immune system uh, develops to help fight this virus. So what you find then is that individuals that are immunocompromised are more prone to Vrusiae or warts. Now the treatment for warts is surgical removal by laser or liquid nitrogen and cryotherapy, salicylic acid, um, as well as paint plaster or even topical blistering agents, which we call beetle juice. Uh, this actually comes from a tree in uh, Caribbean islands. Now if you notice though that all of these treatments essentially just aim to remove that patch of skin that happens to have the papillomavirus infection. And if deep enough, this should be pretty effective at removing that virus locally. Now, herpes simplex virus, we've talked about before, because this is one of those sexually transmitted viruses. Um, now, there's two, sub two subtypes we'll talk about here, HSV-1 and 2. HSV-1 typically occurs in skin above the waist. So common to lips, face, mouth, and those areas of mucous membrane. Now, pain is common, and healing occurs within about two weeks. However, pain can persist uh, even in viral latency or dormancy. Now, you can't eliminate this virus once you're infected because this, the herpes simplex goes dormant within the ganglia of your cranium and spinal cord. Now, the HSV2 is responsible for most infections below the waist, so genital area. So you think about this as being more sexually transmitted. However, these could you know, be vice versa. You can have HSV2 infection of the oral mucosa or HSV1 infection of the genital mucosa. Now, it's typically benign with a burning or tingling sensation, followed by vesicles and erythema. Then there's crusts that occur before healing, and then those crusts fall off. Unfortunately, there's no cure for herpes simplex um, because we can't eliminate the virus from the neurons of our body. I mean, really the only way to do it would be to remove those neurons, but you need them. So uh, essentially what we have then is treatment like analgesics and antivirals to shorten the duration of outbreaks. But unfortunately, you can't eliminate herpes outbreak, uh, or herpes infection, once you're infected. So it's important to note, too, that uh, individuals aren't only infectious if they have active lesions. You know, someone might actually have herpes, and maybe they have uh, a titer that's low enough to that they don't get uh, an actual sore in the oral or genital area, but that, is, that they're still infectious because they're still shedding virus. Herpes zoster is uh, essentially shingles. Now, shingles only comes after, you know, secondarily and later following a chickenpox infection, and it's actually due to varicella zoster virus. So varicella zoster virus, VZVs, human herpes type 3, and it effectively uh, causes chickenpox. Now, there's a chickenpox vaccine now, Zostavax. It's been available since the late 90s, um, but there's still individuals who are carrying varicella zoster virus. And um, shingles is the rash that occurs later in life following chickenpox. So you can't get shingles unless you've already had chickenpox. But it's essentially an acute localized inflammatory disease that affects a particular dermatomal segment because it follows the dermatome or nerve pathway of your skin. Now it results from reactivation of latent virus in your cranial or, or spinal cord ganglia. 
and it's an interruption of painful vesicles that cause erythema, and it's typically unilateral. And uh, the treatment for this is antiviral drugs, preferably within two days. There is a vaccine, and we also use co compresses to uh, reduce the inflammation associated with shingles. Now, in terms of other infectious agents, uh, fungi also infect the skin. So there's three genres that infect human skin. There's mycosporum, uh, trichophyton, and epidermophyton. Now, but all fungal infections of the skin we refer to as tinea. So uh, depending on where the fungal infection occurs is, well, is going to give its name. So if it occurs in the scalp, we call it tinea capitis, like your cap. If it occurs in the beard, we call it tinea barbae. If it occurs in the face, it's tinea fasciae. If it's in the trunk, tinea corporis. If it occurs in the hand, it's tinea manis. Or if it's in the groin, tinea curis. And if it's in the foot, tinea pedis. So tinea pedis would be athlete's, athlete's foot. Um, now, what happens is this causes an erythematous macule. Remember, that's, that's a flattened raised region. Or plaques with peripheral scaling and central clearing. Because of this peripheral scaling and central clearing, it has kind of a circular type of rash, right? It's going to look more like a ring. And so because of this, people mistake this as a worm, and so they call it ringworm. However, ringworm has nothing to do with like a worm infection of your skin. Effectively, it's a fungal infection, and it just looks, the rash looks that way because of the way that uh, basically it clears. So you get peripheral scaling and central clearing, which makes it sort of ring-shaped. Now, um, topical antifungals are usually effective. However, systemic therapy may be required for more resistant infections. So this is showing an example of tinea. Remember, it's occurring on the face. This, this would be an example of tinea fasciae. <coughs> and you can see <coughs> sort of a scaling here on the uh, rash. Now, what we don't see is that sort of ring-like appearance. Uh, and it's possible that this is just sort of a newer rash. It may get some more central clearing later. However, you do see a little bit of clearing here in the central regions of this lesion. You can see a little bit down here as well. Now, uh, other fungal infections can include yeast like candida albicans. Now, that's a common source of superficial skin infections. In infants, it manifests thrush. In bedridden patients and infants, we call it interigo in skin. And uh, if it's in the oral cavity, it can cause mucocutaneous candidiasis, which you see in immunocompromised like, like AIDS patients. So remember, mucocutaneous candidiasis was one of those sequelae of AIDS because of an immunocompromised um, you know, barrier. We can't help fight against candida. So the treatment for this is just sort of nystatin, mouth rinse, and uh, clotrimazole trotches. And these actually help to eliminate yeast from the oral cavity or even skin. Otherwise, we can use topical antifungals and systemic meds if it's severe enough. Uh, we're going to next move on to talk about the bacterial infections of skin. And the first one here we'll talk about is impetigo. So impetigo is an acute contagious skin disease characterized by vesicles, pustules, and yellowish crusts usually caused by staph or strep. Now, it is infectious because it's staph and strep, and it can be treated with topical applications or oral antibiotics. This is showing an example of impetigo. You can see it actually causes a pretty severe rash here. Um, you know, we get a little bit of erythema or redness. We get some uh, macules as well, some, some larger boule here, right? So the boule would be a, like, larger than a pustule. This is pretty big, and it's, um, you know, so it's filled with fluid. Um, and uh, you can see that because of the skin bar barrier is being compromised, there's some crusting here, which is essentially, you know, the body's uh, attempt to try to maintain that skin barrier. Uh, if it's severe enough, it can cause scarring, which could be, you know, uh, lo long term. Now, syphilis is also one of these bacterial infections of skin. Now, uh, it's colloquially referred to as bad blood. So you might hear of uh, people uh, referring to a prior syphilis infection as having bad blood, um, not to be confused with the Taylor Swift song, although maybe, maybe she's suggesting something. <laughs> and uh, it's a serious STD that is uh, transmitted by treponema pallidum. This is a spirochete that's transmitted sexually. Primary syphilis is really just the canker on the genitals. However, secondary syphilis is where you get the disseminated rash. So what happens is you get the primary syphilis, it goes dormant, it spreads throughout the body, it infects the skin, causing syphilis rash, and then if left untreated, it can progress to internal organs like your central nervous system and your heart, causing permanent 
cardiac and central nervous system damage, which could be life-threatening. Now, it's diagnosed through serum antibodies and pustules that can be biopsied to determine the presence of a spirochete. And penicillin is very effective in eradicating syphilis. However, there are penicillin-resistant strains of syphilis now um, around the world. Now, uh, leprosy is also an example of a bacterial infection of skin. It's caused by Mycobacterium leprae, diagnosed through skin biopsy. This is one of those normal soil bac bacterium. You know, we don't think about it existing other than like the, the dark ages. However, it still exists today in the soil worldwide. Now, if you're, you know, if you have a lifestyle where you're around a lot of soil and maybe a compromised immune system or a disrupted uh, skin membrane, uh, it can put you at risk for mycobacterium leprae. So uh, usually responsive to sulfone drugs and uh, because the mycobacterium leprae can go deep in your body, it may also require corrective orthopedic surgery if it affects uh, your bony tissue. So this is showing an example of nodular leprosy, very extreme example here. You can see these large nodules that have developed due to excessive inflammation from uh, mycobacterium leprae uh, infecting the skin of this patient. Now, uh, other inflammatory conditions we'll, we'll talk about uh, include lupus. So, systemic lupus erythematosus, um, you know, uh, essentially is the one that has a butterfly-shaped rash. This differs from discoid lupus because you, sent, you find that this looks like scaly red plaques with scarring that involves sun-exposed skin. It's more slow to heal under therapy, and this has more circular types of rashes. Whereas systemic lupus has more of the butterfly-shaped rash on the cheeks and nose, which we saw um, previously when we talked about um, you know, uh, lupus-associated uh, joint derangement. Now, uh, what we find then is that it affects other organs as well, you know, including the central nervous system and joints, but it responds fairly well to steroid therapy because it, you know, it is an autoimmune disease, and so you essentially want to help to reduce that inflammation. Now, seborrheic dermatitis is a papulosquamous skin disease that's manifested by varying degrees of scaling and erythema, typically in areas of high oil gland concentration. So in adults, we call it dandruff. So this is a very fancy way of saying dandruff. You find a lot of oil glands in the scalp, hence the name dandruff. However, dandruff can occur elsewhere too, wherever there's high concentrations of oil glands. In infants, we call it cradle cap. And essentially, it's just inflammation of that area of skin where you find a lot of sebaceous glands. Now, it's treated topically with things like tar and zinc, selenium sulfide or salicylic acid shampoos can be helpful for the scalp-associated uh, form of seborrheic dermatitis. Now, psoriasis is, is a condition where we find papules and plaques with overlying silverly scale. Now, uh, it's, an, it's a heritable condition with immune system involvement. You typically find these lesions on joints like knees, elbows, lower back, the scalp, as well as your nails. It's marked by periods of exacerbation and remission. Um, and then these periods can include seasonal changes as well. So you might find that individuals may have, may have more psoriasis in the winter months than the summer months. Now, treatments for psoriasis are aimed at reducing the inflammation associated with it. But unfortunately, there's no cure. You know, we have topical corticosteroids. There's vitamin D derivatives as well. However, because vitamin D is a fat-soluble uh, vitamin, it's, it's actually possible to overdose on these kinds of drugs. So frequent blood tests are required for these. Uh, ultraviolet light exposure. Again, this also explains why individuals with psoriasis are less likely to have rashes in the summer months because there's more light. Uh, tar seems to be helpful, uh, as well as sorolin, methotrexate, hydroxyurea, and different injectable biologic agents, really. And just, you just got to figure out what worked for that individual. Now, uh, lichen planus is a common chronic puritic disease. It involves inflammation and um, papular eruption of the skin and mucous membranes. It can be stimulated by drugs or chemicals. So we think of lichen planus as being one of those drug eruptions or even chemical exposure from, let's say, cleaning products. Now, uh, lesions can be shiny, white-topped, and purplish. They're also polygonal, and um, they're typically very itchy. Now, they uh, usually self-limit, and you want to discontinue all medications or chemicals that may be potentially, uh, you know, causing lichen planus. And then topical corticosteroids and antipyretic drugs can help to reduce the inflammation associated with this condition. So this is showing lichen planus here, and you can see these are like the, the small silverly, uh, silvery 
papules here, and you can find it on the distal extremities. Now they're very itchy. So you can see that you know this is probably the primary lesion, but if you look closely, you'll see that there's regions where the skin has been uh, broken, probably by excessive itching. So this would be an example of a primary lesion. These would be secondary lesions. So you gotta really differentiate between those primary versus secondary lesions to figure out what you're looking at. Now, uh, pityriasis rosea is a rash of unknown origin. It typically affects younger adults, and we find that there's macules and papules with surrounding erythema. Lesions spread with central clearing, so the rash kind of looks like ringworm. However, you find it that it's more widespread than tinea. Uh, so it's going to be all over the skin. Now, there's a higher incidence in the spring and fall, and it's typically self-limiting within 2 to 10 weeks. It's treated with topical steroids and antihistamines, as well as colloid baths, and erythromycin and steroids if it's severe, right? So the erythromycin would sort of be, be like a, a prophylactic, you know, antibiotic in case you've been itching them and you might be at risk from, from infection from that itch. Now, acne vulgaris is also considered an inflammatory condition, and it's a disease of the sebaceous glands. Pilosebaceous glands are those ones that are associated with hair. So we're saying that you're going to find acne only in areas where there's hair, because that's where you find sebaceous glands. It affects most people. 90% of individuals get acne. And that's something you can reassure your patients about. Now, it arises when sludging of sebaceous oils deposit and um, form a plug within the follicular canals. And because these oils are rich in nutrients and you have dead cells, bacteria like to feed on it. Bacteria like to feed on this, and uh, that's actually the uh, result. That actually leads to the acne itself. Now, it's treated through the uh, you know, drugs that cause peeling of the stratum corneum, which loosens those follicular plugs, as well as topical agents that can um, you know, help to fight infection or loose those, loosen those plugs to help improve flow and then reduce that um, infection. Now, pemphigus is a group of related disorders. I mean, we have pemphigus vulgaris, vegetans, fallacious, and erythematis. And it's characterized by these bullous eruptions, or blisters, on the skin and mucous membranes. It's an autoimmune reaction. And essentially what happens here is your immune system creates antibodies against the keratinocytes of your skin, as well as your basement membrane. So what you, have, what you end up getting, though, are these large bullous blisters that can really compromise your skin barrier and can put you at risk for a secondary infection. Now, the treatment for this is cortisone and uh, basically just drugs to limit the immune reaction, that way you can prevent these lesions from getting too large. This is shown an example of pemphigus. You can see these lesions are, you know, can be fairly large. This is probably the thigh region. It seems to be groin or something. Um, and you can see here then that there's these large bullous eruptions. These are full of fluid, exudative fluid. And uh, you can see that they have burst here. Now, this is a significant risk factor for infection, which, you know, can lead to um, essentially necrosis. And, uh, you know, basically because it's autoimmune, you want to prevent, um, you know, your immune system from being overly active. So immunosuppressive agents are effective against pemphigus vulgaris. Now, other allergic skin reactions uh, include things like atopic dermatitis. Uh, atopy is a genetic component. So it typically runs in families. You're going to find that's more common in children and it improves with age. These lesions are itchy, oozing, crusting and they might cause a thickening of skin, or which we call lichenification. Uh, moisturization helps decrease the frequency of bathing. That way your skin doesn't get dry. Using tepid water baths, again, so you don't wash off too much oils off your skin. Um, eliminating alkaline soaps and uh, topical steroids and antihistamines can be used as well to uh, essentially limit the amount of itchiness from this dermatitis. Now, contact dermatitis is a cutaneous reaction due to irritation or allergy. This is from chemicals, plants, you know. Uh, essentially, it's allergic contact, which uh, is a, an acquired hypersensitivity from a specific allergen. So, you know, you get roost dermatitis from things like poison ivy, oak, and sumac. And if you all remember, this was an example of a hypersensitivity where haptin forms that excessive immune reaction. And because it's an immune-mediated mechanism, what we can do is treat it with steroids and, um, you know, corticosteroids for up to two weeks in order to limit your immune system's response. Uh, drug eruptions can also occur, and these are essentially, uh, you know, you can think about these as being allergic reactions to a particular drug. 
typically occurs within one week of exposure, and it's the most common eruption you have is maculopapular rash, usually widespread. Severe cases include Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which is a life-threatening type of reaction due to certain drugs. And the treatment for this is really just dis discontinuing the offending agent. So if something co someone comes in with a maculopapular rash and they just started a new drug, it's possible that it's due to a drug eruption. So you know you can determine this by you know seeing if they if they stop taking that drug if you know if that helps the problem. Now uh, vasculitis is this severe necrotizing inflammation when antigens and antibodies react with blood vessels. It can be caused by drug allergies or systemic conditions. And this uh, has some subcategories like polyarteritis nodosa, which is essentially a systemic vasculitis that's due to inflamed arteries and visceral organs, brain, and skin. In severe cases, you know, systemic corticosteroids can be used to limit the amount of vasculitis. And that way their, their blood vessels remain, uh, you know, healthy. Now, uh, what we're going to move next is talking about some of the other infectious agents like parasitic infestations. So scabies is caused by this Sarcoptes scabii, it's a mite, begins when eggs lay, uh, the mite lays eggs in stratum corneum. Those hatch into larvae within several days, and those larvae remain within skin where they feed on dead skin cells. Now it's, co it's contracted after close contact with an infested individual, and you get these small erythematous papules with overlying dry scalar crust. Fortunately, it's treatable with topical creams like... Um, permethrin cream, or even uh, gamma benzene hexachloride, or uh, crotamatum. Uh, these essentially target the mite. Now, fleas are also considered a parasitic infection because these bites, um, you know, appear as a skin eruption like macules, papules, and wheels. Essentially, what happens is you get an eruption uh, due to some of the flea molecules that are left behind in your skin following the bite. And uh, essentially the drugs that uh, are used to um, basically treat the flea bites are essentially soothing shake lotions or topical steroids, basically just things that reduce the inflammation. Otherwise, we have drugs that target the flea organism itself. Now, these are showing examples of flea bites. You can see that the small papules here that people react to differently, but, you know, if severe enough, they can be extremely pyretic and, uh, you know, uh, cause, you know, extreme discomfort, especially if it's on the back. It's going to be difficult to sleep. Now, uh, other parasitic infections include lice. And lice are an, an example of an arthropod or insect that, you know, likes to live in hairy regions of the body where you find a lot of sebaceous secretions. So there's crab lice, head lice, body lice, and pubic lice. And these essentially are surface dwelling. Uh, they're typically readily seen because they're large enough to be seen with the naked eye. And eradication is possible with permethrin cream, or other types of liquid gels and shampoos that can help to remove this organism from uh, the hairy regions of your body. Uh, and chiggers are these mites that reside in grass or brushes. They're common in the southern United States, and puncture of the skin produces these itchy papules. Now, essentially, the chiggers actually uh, stay within your skin, and uh, scratching and excoriations can occur from basically your immune reaction. And unfortunately, this can put you at risk for bacteria, which can uh, lead to a secondary infection with staph or strep or you know, other microorganisms in your skin. Treatment for this is palliative. Unfortunately, uh, there's, no, there's no treatment other than just you know, uh, making sure someone feels comfortable until the sugar leaves your skin. Um, and it's preventive with insect repellent and also just wearing proper clothing. That way you're not having exposed skin to grass or brush. Now, bed bugs are this reddish brown insect that uh, turn purple after feeding. They're nocturnal feeders, and you actually find these, therefore, around where people sleep, so around their bed. Um, they produce a painless, puritic oval, and uh, these actually can be multiple lesions that are uh, typically uniform and kind of linear. The treatment for this is antipuretics, and essentially you have to eliminate the bed bug in order to prevent further bites. So professional extermination is advised because they are intelligent creatures, or at least well adapted, and they're able to hide very well. So professional extermination is advised. Now this is shown an example of bed bug bites. You can see that they typically bite in threes and in a row. They also usually affect the, those regions of your body that are right on the bed sheet. So you can tell that this individual is probably laying on their side, 
which means the bed bug could crawl across the sheet and just bite right at the exposed skin there on the sheet itself. Now mosquitoes, we also consider parasitic uh, microorganisms because they basically feed on your blood. These lesions lead to a wheel um, that occurs 8 to 12 hours after the bite and uh, saliva is a suspected source of the lesion. So you basically get an immune reaction to the mosquito's saliva. It's treated with local antipyretics and you know you can be prevented with insect repellents. Uh, blood flukes are also in a type of parasitic infection that are essentially a larva of worms that you find that are, uh, in, you know, they actually like to infect things like ducks and other freshwater mammals. And you find this especially in the Great Lakes region like Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota. And it causes what we call swimmer's itch. So what this causes is an inflammatory papular and itchy urticarial type of rash that uh, you find in uncovered areas of the body, mainly the legs. Lake water may be treated for blood flukes, however, rapidly drying also prevents penetration. There's also medications to relieve the itching, but you know, just basically making sure that you can brush water off your body as soon as you get off a lake, and also not you know, keeping your legs dipped in lake water too long because these blood flukes can wiggle in your skin. Uh, ticks are also considered a parasitic infection. You find these living in wooded and underbrush regions. Um, they are attracted some, to some of the molecules that we release in our secretions of our skin. And they also carry infectious bacteria or viruses that have human hosts that can cause a variety of illness. You know, things like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever or Lyme disease, you know, these are transmissible by ticks. So Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, transmitted by ticks, it's caused by Rickettsia rickettsii. Most states have reported cases, so it's kind of a misnomer to call it Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever because it occurs in more than just the Rocky Mountains. However, the initial bite appears as a papular macule. You find that within four to eight days, you get headache, fever, nausea, vomiting, due to that inflammatory immune reaction. Muscle aches can appear, macular papular, papular rashes can appear. It's treated with hospitalization, antibiotics, and it's really prevented by removing a tick correctly and also just preventing tick bites in general. So this is showing those, that what Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever looks like, and you can see it's this macular papular rash that typically occurs in the distal extremities, you know, especially like the ankles, wrists, hands, and feet. Now, Lyme disease is also one of those things that's transmitted by ticks, and it's a spirochete called Borrelia burgdorferi. It affects skin, nervous system, heart, and your musculoskeletal system. Earlier, we talked about how it affects uh, your joints, but here, we'll, we'll talk about what happens in the skin. So in the first stage, it causes these erythematous papules that itch, burn, or sting, you get flu-like symptoms due to the inflammation. And stage two is when it spreads to the brain, causing meningitis and cranial nerve palsies, also peripheral neuropathy. In uh, stage three, this is where it spreads to your joints, causing oligoarticular arthritis due to inflammation um, within those joints. Really uh, treated with long-term antibiotics, and they're required in order to eliminate um, this particular microorganism. So sclerodura is a collagen disease of unknown cause. Uh, <clears throat> it's fibrosis accompanied by inflammation, and you get vascular changes as well. And it's localized to the skin, or it can also lead to uh, systemic involvement. When it's localized, it causes single, multiple, violet-colored and firm inelastic macules and plaques. When it's diffuse, the skin hardens like a hide, and the esophagus and GI tract become semi-rigid. Now, the lungs and heart also become fibrotic, and bones resorb, and overlying tissues calcify. And in this sense, it'll eventually become fatal. Uh, sunburn uh, is essentially a type of UV radiation burn. So you can think of a sunburn as radiation burn. And it can be from indirect or direct sunlight. And uh, basically, sunburn it manifests as an erythema, pain and heat, possibly even blistering of a second degree and edema and tenderness. Severe cases can lead to chills, fever, nausea, and generalized discomfort. This is from excessive inflammation. Cold water baths can be useful, as well as topical steroids. And really the prevention of this would be to limit exposure to the sun, wearing sunscreen, as well as UV protective clothing. Um, in terms of other disorders of the dermis, we have ulcers here, and they're basically localized areas of necrosis that result from prolonged pressure. So these pressure sores or decubitus ulcers, the most common in bedridden and elderly, and the risks of this include poor nutrition because that's going to weaken the skin, aging because of neuropathy and you'll be able to feel pain, 
as well. Immobility, because if you are immobile and you're laying on a particular bony prominence longer, you're more likely to develop an ulcer. And superficial sensory loss, as well as bowel and bladder incontinence, because uh, if someone is sitting in a wet diaper, you know, uh, over time, that's going to weaken the skin. Now, they're evaluated clinically using a staging system, and the treatment for this is really just to keep the area clean, dry, and free from infection. Uh, also, to cover with a nonstick dressing and irrigate is needed. You know, protein stores and vitamin supplements can be useful, as well as avoiding infection. The way you want to prevent these pressure ulcers is frequent turning in the you know in bedridden and wheelchair bound individuals every two hours, turning every two hours. So getting the person out of bed into a chair, keeping vulnerable areas clean and dry, and also keeping bed coverings off feet because even those bed coverings can lead to ulcers. Now, uh, what, we're what we'll move on to next are basically uh, altered areas of cell growth, so the proliferative diseases. And we'll talk about the tumors here. So each cell type of the skin can give rise to a benign or malignant tumor. And remember, uh, the, the major cell type of skin is the keratinocyte. So a squamous papilloma comes from the keratinocytes. Otherwise, the melanocytes can turn into moles and lipomas come from adipose cells you find within you know, dermis and subcutaneous tissue. Vascular tumors we call hemangiomas. These can, become from, uh, these can come from blood vessel proliferation within the dermis or subcutaneous tissue. Dermatofibromas come from fibroblasts, and these neuromas come from nerves. Now, uh, cancer is the most common uh, in skin, and uh, what we find is that it may progress slowly but or rapidly, some of the risks for cancer include sunlight, exposure to irritating chemicals because this can lead to metaplasia, dysplasia, and then recurrent trauma and irradiation, again, because of metaplasia, dysplasia, or even mutations from irradiation. Now, basal cell carcinomas are the most common. They're benign. And squamous cells carcinomas can metastasize. Melanomas are more rare and lethal. And removal is the best treatment. And uh, really, the, the way to... Catch these is early diagnosis, so getting frequent skin checks because a professional can recognize skin cancer. And uh, this is showing an example of malignant melanoma. You can see it's identifiable. Uh, for one, it has a darker appearance. And it's not true that all melanomas look dark, but if it's dark, that suggests a growth of melanocytes. You can see with this example, there's a redness around the lesion. This is caused from by an inflammatory immune response because the immune system is trying to remove these cancerous cells. Now, the reason why melanoma is so fatal is that the melanocytes are found deep within the epidermis, and they're more likely to break away and metastasize and spread to distant sites. You know, and there's been times where I've seen in cadavers where essentially there's melanoma everywhere throughout the body um, because it's spread from some skin site to their lungs, their heart, you know, even deep within their muscles. So it's kind of, it's interesting. Uh, this is showing a very extreme example of melanoma. You can see it has irregular borders. Uh, it's dark because of those melanocytes, and it's also inflamed because of immune reactions. Now, uh, vitiligo is actually a pigmentation alteration, and this is where pigment disappears from a patch of skin. It usually has a sudden onset, and it's associated with things like anemia and hyperthyroidism, sometimes diabetes as well. These depigmented patches uh, will have a definite smooth border, and um, the treatment for this is really uh, immunomodulating agents and various types of UV light to help kind of, you know, blend the skin colors. There's also different cosmetics like Dermablend cosmetics can kind of hide the appearance of these depigmented patches of skin. This is shown an example of vitiligo. So you can see where this, there's depigmented patches with a very clear border and there are definite boundaries here. Um, and it's suspected that Michael Jackson had vitiligo. Now, uh, albinism is also a pigmentation alteration, but it's partial or total absence of melanin that could be an inborn error of metabolism. So we see that there's generalized lack of skin and hair pigmentation. So these individuals don't have that extra protective barrier in their skin, so they're more prone to you know, the damaging effects of UV radiation. So to protect against this, they wear a lot of sunscreen, sunglasses, protective clothing, and really just uh, avoidance behavior to limit their exposure to UV. Uh, in terms of infancy-related skin disorders, uh, Mongolian spots are caused by selective pigmentation. This is normal. We think of these as being more like a birthmark. Hemangiomas can also occur developmentally. They're a vascular skin disorder where essentially you have you know, 
uh, strawberry and port wine varieties. The strawberry hemangiomas are more red, raised, and they typically disappear within several years after birth. Port wine stained hemangiomas are flat, reddish purple, and they typically don't disappear. Now, uh, you can be born with nevi that can occur in varying sizes and shapes, and a prolonged exposure to a warm, humid environment can cause prickly heat for infants. And contact dermatitis is also, or diaper rash is where you have soiled diapers, and um, this can they can get rashes from you know essentially the you know the chemicals you find in feces or urine. Uh, so changing frequently and exposing that wet skin to air can uh, help prevent contact dermatitis. Cradle cap we talked about with seborrheic dermatitis with an infants, and it's a self-limiting kind of scaly scalp condition that's inflammatory, but it's not a cause for concern. So what this is showing are different types of skin dermatoses. We have the strawberry hemangioma, usually disappears in you know uh, childhood. The port wine stain hemangiomas typically don't disappear. They're called port wine stains because they're a little purplish in appearance. Mongolian spots are more common in, in African Americans and Asians, and they have it's just sort of a darker pigmented area. You know moles and nevi can appear as well. Um, otherwise, other skin conditions include diaper uh, rash or basically contact dermatitis. We have seborrheic dermatitis, which is cradle cap, and prickly heat, which is just exposure to warm, humid air. Now, other childhood skin disorders uh, include things like rubella. We call it this three-day measles, also called German measles. It's caused by rubella virus. It's characterized by this diffuse punctate macular rash that begins in the trunk, but then spreads to the arms and legs. You know, mild febrile states can occur. However, if a pregnant mother is infected with rubella, uh, severe teratogenic effects can occur in the unborn fetus, and uh, this is this is why we want to prevent it with proper immunization with the measles, mumps, rubella, or MMR vaccine. Now, roseola infantum is this contagious viral disease that has characteristic macular papular rash, covers the trunk, and spreads the appendages. It also produces febrile states. However, these are more intense because you have a 105 degrees Fahrenheit or more, and this also produces cold-like symptoms. Uh, it's treated with antipyretic drugs because you want to reduce that fever, cooling baths, and also uh, topical lotions for any kind of itching that may occur. Now, measles, we call hard or seven-day measles. It's caused by rubiola, or I'm sorry, also called rubiola, but it's caused by morbili virus, and it's a rash that's macular and blotchy, begins on the face, and then spreads the appendages. You also get febrile state, coplic spots in the buccal mucosa, and photosensitivity. Treated with dark room and rest and fluids, and also prevented prevented with the uh, MMR vaccine. Now, chickenpox is also one of those uh, childhood skin disorders that's caused by a varicella zoster, and that's a herpes, human herpes type three. Characteristic skin lesion occurs in three stages. You got a macule that turns into a vesicle that also turns into a scab, like other herpes uh, lesions. The rash starts on the body and spreads to the limbs, and you get puritis and cold-like symptoms. Uh, it's treated with antipyretic drugs and lukewarm baths as well as antihistamines. Uh, Vaccination is currently recommended for people, you know, more recent births. However, if you've already had chickenpox, uh, it's in your body and it's dormant within your cranial or, or uh, spinal ganglia. And uh, you can't eliminate it, unfortunately. However, it can reactivate as shingles. This is just showing that, that characteristic chickenpox rash here. So you can see that, it, you know, it's, diff it's the more diffuse... You have sort of these punctate macular papular rashes that are, are extremely itchy. In fact, you can see the secondary lesions here on his buttocks, uh, where you can see that they've uh, itched and kind of uh, caused these pox. Now, these pox can scar, hence the name chicken pox, because it leaves a little divot in their skin uh, later, and that's actually due to the secondary lesion. So it's important to have these kids not scratch these lesions, even if they're itchy, because that can lead to scarring, which is lifelong. And I've got scars on my face to prove it. <laughs> now, uh, scarlet fever is a systemic reaction to toxins produced by, you know, group uh, A beta hemolytic streptococci. Now, we talked about this going back with, uh, you know, basically, you know, the rheumatic uh, joint diseases as well as rheumatic fever with, um, you know, the heart. And it's characterized by pink punctate skin rash on neck, chest, axilla, groin, and thighs. You get flushing of the face. <laughs> And circumolar pallor, nausea, vomiting can occur, as well as strawberry tongue, raspberry tongue. Complications can develop, you know, joint disorders and valvular disorders, uh, and it's treated with penicillin. 
Now, other developmental considerations, uh, you know, adolescents and young adults are more commonly afflicted with acne because of increased production of sex hormones. Uh, you know, in terms of the geriatric, what we see is that more than 90% have some sort of skin disorder. They're more prone to things like keratoses and psoriasis. Angiomas and lentigenes, which are liver spots and skin tags. Uh, cancerous and precancerous lesions are also common because they've had more years to develop these from repeated exposure and therefore require very careful screening and uh, you know, evaluation to see if these lesions are changing, if there's any new ones, so they need more frequent skin checks.